this podcast is brought to you by Midwinter. These guys were a startup, an entrepreneurial startup some 10 years ago, way before it was even cool to be a tech startup, and have since then gone on to win every single award year after year after year when it comes to financial advice software. I use them, um, I know a lot of people that have, and if you haven't already jumped onto the new way of doing business, which is all cloud-based and API, so it all talks to each other, then go look at yourself in the mirror and sort yourself out and go get Midwinter. All right, let's get started. So Vanessa Stoikov, the CEO and founder of Evolution Media. So thank you very much for coming today and talking to us about, you know, how do we make advice mainstream? Mm, a big issue, right? And now a challenge and an opportunity all at once. Exactly. So just to kick us off, give us an idea of what Evolution Media is and, and no more practice and how do they both combine together and, you know, how do you guys make money? What's the business? Yeah, good question. So uh, we started Evolution Media 17 years ago now with the premise that uh, money is interesting, why is finance boring? So uh, we started a creative services business and we started with PR and then um, my husband joined the business. He'd been in advertising for 25 years. So we've worked together for 13 years now without killing each other. Uh, and then we built marketing capability. So we were sort of a full service creative agency and then realized that the future would be online television and video. So we sold the PR business, which was quite big in 2010 and really focused on online television. So we launched what we called back then Evo TV and uh, we launched several channels of content and then very quickly realized, wow, content is a very big beast and we can't feed all of them. But we'd started a couple of things which really took off. And one of them was a show called No More Practice, which followed two financial advisors selling their business, which is 10 years ago now. And that was the start of No More Practice, which is our online education business. So now we have two very distinct companies. Evolution creates uh, inspiring content for financial services and No More Practice is an online learning business. So we have 26,000 subscribers, uh, about 11,000 of which are advisors in that business and we train advisors through major licensee groups like Westpac and Combank and um, we also have individual IFAs who do training through us through our website. So just give us an idea, Evolution Media cr creates and produces content uh, and your Correct. clients are mainly the big, uh, the bigger businesses? Well our clients are uh, actually a lot of fund managers. So um, fund managers need to communicate their proposition in a different way. So we do everything from, we've created a TV show called the Investment Series, where we have an advisor take a client through a journey of watching some of the best fund managers in the world pitch to um, the guardians who are the heads of the research houses. So we've dramatized what is, you know, the process of researching funds management, how an advisor would assess them. Um, and that's probably the secret to what we do is that we put entertainment principles and media principles around our learning. Mm. No, that that's, sounds good. And no more practice. Uh, that, uh, is that consumer focused or advisor focused? Both. So predominantly it started as advisor focused and we really, I mean, if fund managers are our clients, advisors are our partners. Um, and so we've got a big B2B education portal for advisors and then we've got a consumer site called the Investment Series, which is to educate end investors around how to grow their wealth. But we really showcase the value of advice as part of that process, what an advisor should do, how they should be adding value so that people can not only think, wow, maybe I should be investing, I should think like an investor, but I probably do need a guide in that process and that guide being a financial advisor. Mm. No, that sounds good. So for everyone watching, we are going to get a chance to ask questions uh, and we'll get to them at the end. So feel free to chuck them out at any time. Um, I, when we had our conversation uh, before the interview, I remember uh, one thing that really stood out to me uh, that I can relate to uh, is you said that content is a beast that you need to keep feeding. Uh, and for anyone who's kind of producing content, I think we can all relate to that. Um, but my qu next question is, why do you guys choose video? You said at the start you think video was the future. Uh, why did you think that? And why do you choose video over any other form of content? 
Yeah, look, people buy people at the end of the day, and it's very hard from the written word or a brochure or an advertisement to get a sense of what a person's like. But video, if done well, can be just as good as being there. So, I mean, we saw that, I was in a conference in New York actually 10 years ago, and it was before broadband had rolled out here, and we were probably a bit leading edge slash bleeding edge back then, because we probably didn't have people accessing the internet as much as we do now, which, you know, but we learned a lot of lessons through that. So, you know, I've seen everyone start to realise, oh, I need to do video. And um, a lot of our clients started by buying their own camera and producing video and then realising, hey, there's like five people looking at this. Maybe I need to do things differently and think about engagement, which is where we come in. So we've got producers, journalists, um, post-production experts, creative experts to develop storyline. So much like making a movie or writing a book, uh, every good piece of content, whether it's a market update or a why choose me as an advisor, needs a good storyline arc. So it's not just a matter of having a video camera. I, I actually think we've gone through that. Everyone wants one, everyone's got one to now, well, no one's watching it. How do we make it interesting? And that's, mm. you know, that's an art form. Yeah, no, definitely an art form. I think anyone who's producing content um, can relate to it. You know, you, you spend a lot of time doing it, you put it out there and you get, you know, either five views or, you know, three people reading your, your uh, blog. Um, so when it, when it comes to advisors, um, should advisors be creating content if uh, there may not be that kind of cut through with our content? Do you think we should be doing it? And if we should be doing it, do you think video is the way to go? Yeah, look, I think it depends on the advisor. Like I know um, some of the advisors who are logged on here actually, and I can see on Twitter, there's some very savvy advisors out there who are good storytellers who definitely should be making content and are making content. But I think they've made that conscious decision to put a percentage of their time and all we really have of value is our time towards doing that to build their brand. And I think if you are passionate about that and have a skill set there, then you should be. But to be honest, if you're not, then you need to look at what your skill sets are. Don't bother doing video and making content if it's not your passion. Either outsource it, so go to an expert, someone who can, or bring in a part-time marketing resource who can help you with that. And that's probably a pretty good solution for a lot of advisors but also own a subject matter. So there's no point having a video unless you've got something different to say. So um, some advisors are great at reducing debt. Some are great investment advisors. Some are really good at why you should have insurance and how to go about that. Find a point of difference and find a voice and then create a channel around that because you can't be everything to everyone and there's a lot of, a lot of content out there. So to be a blog that's read or... I mean, we've spent 10 years to build our audience of giving really high quality free content away. Um, and it's an expensive commitment. So unless you've got something different to say, I don't think there's much point actually. And if you're looking for new clients, how have you always found them? How can you use the internet to amplify how you've always found clients? We've just done a um, shoot, which was fascinating with 10 different advisors. And we asked them, what's the best piece of advice they ever gave? And we'll be releasing that next year as part of our, you know, here's what advisors do. And it was really interesting because every one of them had very different advice and there are very different things they'd learned. So that was an example of we chose a subject and we let everyone have a say around that and we'll create a content stream. So it really is about finding an engaging, interesting conversation and trying to own it, whether it be blog, video, social, Twitter, um, I don't think advisors can do it all unless you're big enough to have a dedicated full-time resource or you're not advising yourself anymore. You are the brand. And that's a big, I think that's a pretty big advice firm that can afford to do that. Mm. Now, uh, I, just a follow-up question on that, uh, that piece of content you did. How many of those advisors uh, talked about the actual strategy, like we set up a TTR versus uh, the advisors who actually told a story about their clients and their client situation? They all told about the client. So, and that was us saying, we don't want to hear about a strategy. We want to hear what was the life changing advice. And I mean, this is the big hint, right? Like people love good stories. Storytelling is one of the oldest art forms in the world. It's how people handed down learning. But people don't want to hear about individual strategies. I mean, when you're getting that granular, you're getting into a very different business than 
here's some advice that may inspire you or may think, hey, I can relate to that or, gee, I wish someone had told me that. So a lot of them, um, <laughs> I told the story, I remember years ago, an accountant said to me when I was in my 20s, I'm a lot older than that now, and I said, the bottom line is spend less, earn more. And I was really annoyed when he said that because I'm like, I don't want to hear that. That's the last thing I want to hear. He was right. But years later, someone said to me, pay yourself first, which was a hell of a lot better way to say pretty much the same thing on, you know, create some savings, don't just blow it all. But I found I didn't want to be told what I couldn't do. And this is the biggest challenge advisors have, right? No one wants the stick. Everyone wants the carrot. So how can you tell stories that involve people getting the carrot but still give the good advice? That's, that's the challenge. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting to, uh, to think about as advisors. How do we, you know, always think about, you know, giving that carrot, you know, through our content. So mm. my, my next question is, what are your top tips for advisors? Let's say uh, small firms uh, who may not be able to uh, have a big budget to produce, you know, a TV show that you guys are doing. Uh, how do we produce video content? Or do you think actually it's probably not worthwhile doing it? I think it's worthwhile, again, for those who have a skill set in being a face of the business. There's a lot of people in funds management advice we work with who we drag kicking and screaming through the process who, you know, just don't want to do it. And I get that, you know, different skill sets, different personality types. But I think, again, you don't have to have a big budget to create good content, but you have to own a good conversation. So as an advisor, if you know you're good at a lot of things, but there's one thing you're really, really passionate about, can you articulate that? Can you write that elevator pitch that, you know, one minute you've got with someone in writing to level 27, that you can say, this is what I do and why I'm passionate about it. And then can you translate that into writing for your website? Everyone needs a website. I think we've gone through that phase. And then can you talk to a client about it, a, a success story? And maybe you can video that. or can you be interviewed by someone else who can, is a decent writer so they can get your story out with a photo? You know, it's not always video, although, you know, you can see the growth in video. There's certainly advantages to people seeing your personality type. So, um, because again, people buy people. And if they're coming down to, should I choose this advisor? Maybe a video of you talking engagingly about your passion will get them closer to making a decision. So, but the first point is find the conversation point. Don't just, think you can introduce yourself on video and that it's going to be a differentiator. You have to find the differentiator before you pick up a camera. That's what we call pre-production. And we spend most of our time, whether it's making a TV show, making an interview or making a very simple piece to camera around pre-production because everything's done before the camera's picked up. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. That's where the work is. And if they can do that work and find that point of difference, then yeah, it's worth doing and it shouldn't cost that much. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I spend, I do videos once a week, and it probably takes me, you know, eighty percent of my time, you know, writing my content uh, before, you know, before I start shooting. So, uh, yeah, I, I totally relate. So, my last question before I hand it over to Ben, uh, and remember, um, throw out some questions if you guys have got any questions. Uh, you, I've heard some murmurs about something, a website that you guys are bringing out that are aimed at advisors. Give me a bit more information about that. Oh, yes, there are murmurs. The six months of our lives, we're never getting back, but it is a beautiful thing. So launch is December 14 of our new advisor website. And I think we're hosting an ARIA event at our office, actually. So if any advisors wanted to come in Sydney, um, jump on the ARIA website and say you'd like to come. But that's where we'll be launching the website. And it'll be um, a much upgraded education and course experience. Plus, we'll have opinions from leading advisors and from experts in the industry, plus our regular blogs. There's a lot of CPD accreditation you can get there. We're launching our new TV show that we're hosting next year on that website. So, um, and actually a new show, I don't know whether I should say anything, but maybe I'll just blab it, um, with Mark Rantel, ex-head of the FPA, on that website too. So, it's, it's a labour of love and I hope very much that advisors will enjoy it. No, that sounds good. Um, so just uh, actually, before I head over to Benny again, um, just this uh, new TV show, what's it, what's it about? 
Well, it's investment series four. So um, it's going to be a bit different this time because we've actually got a celebrity going through the process of understanding how some pretty amazing investment managers go about investing. Um, we've got an advisor in the program who takes that celebrity through the process and it's, it'll be televised again on national TV. And yeah, I guess it's inching closer and closer towards making advice and investing mainstream very high production values, very high entertainment value, shot in some amazing locations. So yes, that's next May and that'll be our next big TV show. Good stuff. I'll throw over to you now, Benny. Cool. Yeah, I just got a, just a follow up question, Vanessa, on that one. With the videos that you guys do, is it mainly investment focused or what's the sort of split that you're seeing between the investment side um, and the like, general, I suppose, advice or strategy sort of element? Mm. Um, from a video perspective, we do three mainstreams. So investment is one of them, thought leadership is one, and um, yeah. practice management. So they're our three video streams that we run and television shows. But our weekly blog that we host, it talks about everything from how to write a better SLA, what's happening in legislation, and we ask experts in the industry to write that. That's not written by us. So okay. every week, in, um, and it's interesting for us to see what topics advisors are interested in. So aged care is a big one. Every time we have anyone write on aged care, we get a lot of hits. So we get between uh, five and 10,000 people a week reading those blogs. Um, and they're also CPD accredited as well. So that's where we can go further in our subject remit, but our video and television is practice management investments for leadership. Okay. And what's the thinking behind not, um, not having, I suppose, the strategy or planning uh, element of the advice as, a, as one of those streams for your video content? Is that something that you, you tried and it didn't work or something that you sort of determined that you don't think is, is appropriate for that media or? You know, we do that for big licensees, but we make it bespoke for them. And obviously that's how we monetize it. They pay us to do that, but it's behind their, um, well, it's in their own LMSs in their learning management systems. So they're making it for their own networks and we're putting their own experts in it. So we do ethics and planning and everything else for big licensee groups like BT um, and ComBank and we're doing stuff with AMP, but it's all um, funded by those licensee networks and um, distributed to them as part of the value add of being part of that licensee. So that part of our education business is behind the lock wall on the other side, which we're open to everyone and is free to access, no more practice. They're the three subject areas that A, we're particularly passionate about and think we've got a pretty good point of difference in and B, that we've monetized. And everyone knows with content being a hungry and expensive beast, you have to have a monetization strategy yeah. or you'll quickly go out of business. Uh, yeah, yeah, mm. fair enough. Yeah, okay, interesting. Um, okay, and so for, for advisors that are sort of might be just getting started on this journey and want to sort of put their toe in the water and maybe try creating some content themselves before they go out and engage someone else to help out, what do you think, like, what is the biggest mistake that you're seeing advisors make? Well, I think talking about strategy as opposed to storytelling about transformational experiences with advice is one. So getting too much into the detail too quickly. Yeah. I think one, um, not having a point of difference. So talking about the same thing as a lot of other people are, which means you're just throwing yourself against that brick wall is another yeah. weekly. Um, you know what? I see a lot of good things too, though, I've got to say. There's some pretty impressive advisors out there um, and I like reading their blogs and I get good ideas from watching their stuff. And I think the biggest thing they've got to find is a distribution network. And it's tough. It's tough to build those channels and you have to spend time on Twitter to get a Twitter following and you have to spend time on Facebook to do that. And you know, it's just time in the game. I'll, I think it's early days yet. I think I see, you know, there's probably maybe 20 advisors that I see that have put a fair bit of time in already and content, but I think it's, any, it's early days yet. Anyone can do it if they have a clearly defined strategy, feed their channels, and don't just make one piece of content and leave it and expect the world to come. It doesn't work like that. I mean, newspapers sell every day for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, that you sort of led into another one of my questions here, which is just around what is your approach when it comes to that amplifying content? And 
Um, and what are you, maybe on a smaller scale, what do, you, what do you think advisors could do to, if they've got something and they think that they're sort of happy with it and they think that, you know, it's hitting the mark, what, can they, what do you think they can do to actually increase their exposure or is there any sort of, what do you guys do? And then, you know, what do you think that people could do if they were trying to do this themselves? You know, there's this um, usability challenge. So how do you turn one thought, one piece of content into seven or eight channels? And what we do is if we have one video interview, we might cut a 30 second clip of that and put that on Twitter. But we let it live in Twitter. We don't make people come back to our website anymore. We actually just let them watch that small piece of content in that channel. And that's been really effective for us. So, I mean, when you've got your content, look at what can you cut for Twitter? What's a thought piece you could put in LinkedIn and how do I tag that? What's a photo from that that I could put a meme against? Can I put an interesting quote out there on Instagram, you know? So if you have your channels that you favour and then you think I've got one piece of content, how do I cut it seven ways? I mean, A, that's cost effective, but B, you're building your channels you know, without having to do seven different ideas across them. That works for us. I mean, we have a big production team, so um, it's certainly a lot yeah. easier doing it all yourself, but it took us a long time to build that, you know. This is our 17th year of business, so it certainly yeah. didn't happen overnight. That's amazing. Yeah, cool. Okay, and then so this might cross over with, with my previous question as well, but you mentioned at the start around, um, you know, Money is interesting, but finance is boring. What is, what's, and you spend all this time on pre-production, but what is the, um, yeah, how do you, how do you make it? What's the, the best way that people can make, make their content not boring? Well, again, it comes back to that. What's the conversation that you want to be part of? If you're going to a party, what could you talk about with people so they didn't back away and their eyes glaze? Remember that ad where everyone was at a barbecue yeah. and they're like, I'm a bank manager. And it's like, oh God, but he had something good to say. Uh, I think sometimes yeah. when you're an advisor, you think people aren't going to be interested in what I say. And I've heard people come up and sort of say, I help change people's lives. And you think, oh, that's interesting. How do you do that? You could be a doctor. You could be, you know, a human rights lawyer. Um, just so yeah. happens you have financial advice. And I think it's about putting a more interesting layer over the detail of what you do because the day-to-day -day of what anyone does isn't all that interesting to be honest i mean some days are good but some days are just boring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but what's that wrapping you can put around it that will take people to go that's interesting i hadn't thought of that like that and everyone's got the ability to do that but it does take thought yeah you know what yeah, it takes right. time and most people don't have time and if you want yeah. to make time for this yeah, um, i think you that's um in your diary Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Like all of the all of the people that I speak to that have been doing content for a while, I know Phil did a um, presentation down at a conference recently, and and uh, you know I think that you definitely get better over over time. But you know a lot of people they they might try and then and then back away from it uh, before they get to that, that point. So cool. Um, what one last question before we turn it over um, to questions from the from the audience. How do you measure success and how do you tell when you produce something, where, you know, whether it's a, a, an effective piece of content? Mm. That's an interesting question because if I ask the, when I say the 20-somethings in my firm, I'll tell you 50 ways we measure it and we do. So we look at how long people spend on the content when they drop off. Um, how many people click through to the content? How many people just read the headline and move away? How many people don't even open it if it's an email? So. You know, we can infinitely measure subject matter and engagement. But, you know, I have, and then maybe I'm just old school because I'm old, um, the gut test. If I want to watch it, I think other people will want to watch it. But the minute I find myself lazing out and thinking of something else, I know it's crap. And, <laughs> like, I think you've got to give yourself that test. Or another one is make your kids watch it. I watch, I've got three sons, and sometimes I force them to watch things we do, <laughs> which oh, is cruel right. and unusual. <laughs> and I watch when their little faces lose interest and, you know, the youngest one does that pretty quickly. But, uh, you know, you, you've got to make this stuff um, for all ages and for all types of people. And I, that's the big secret to making advice mainstream, you know. Like, how do we get in the psyche of people 
I talk a lot about Anthony Robbins and I know people either love or hate him, you know, but from a motivation perspective, like he's an interesting guy, right? Because he makes people want to change. And a big challenge that we have in advice is how do we make people want to change their behaviors? And so you've got to tap into emotion and emotional intelligence and finding that conversation that makes people feel, not just think, that's where the gold is. Yeah. Awesome, awesome tips. And it sounds like you guys have very interesting dinner table conversations in, in your house. Uh, <laughs> before the kids went to school, I was making them watch a documentary that we just shot. Oh, and really? my little boy was watching you know, the seven-year-old sculpt out of the room in about a minute. But, um, <laughs> you know, my 11-year-old watched it for longer and I thought, yeah, we've hit upon something here. I've got him for longer. It's good storytelling. So... Yeah, my boys, our boys have grown up in the office because my husband's our creative director and we work together. So and they're a good litmus test of when things get boring. Yeah, the boring test. I like it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, awesome. So I'm, I'm going to jump into some questions from the guys watching in. Um, for anyone that is watching, if, you, if you've got any questions for Vanessa, if you just type them into the chat box, um, we're going to get to them in a second. Um, the first question we got here from... Uh, Adrian Paddy, also the um, shirtless man that featured for a few seconds at the start of the session. Um, what do you think of explainer videos like cartoons and animations? Uh, yeah, I can see Adrian's comment come up now. I thought it was actually funny. It made the seminar more interesting having shirtless man at the start. Um, <laughs> it depends how good they are, is the bottom line. Like, I think. I find them a bit patronising, like, to be honest, but maybe it's because I look at content so critically. I think there's some people who need an explanation of what a good advisor does. It just depends what sort of content you like. I'd much rather see a compelling story from real people than an animation, but that's, that's just me. Okay. Now, that's good. Next question is from Brett Evans. Uh, if you're going to get one thing right, what would it be? Uh, the content uh, in terms of visu uh, visual videos, audio, or written words? The one thing I'd get is the story. I mean, everything else flows from that. Even if your video's crap and your audio's fuzzy and everything else, if the story's interesting, people will hang in there. Like, find the conversation point that sets you apart and makes people want to engage. That is the most important part of content. Cool. And, and so just on that, do you think it's, it's about um, the, the, obviously in the, the pre-production sort of phase as we're coming up with that, that, that storyline, but is it more, do you think that articulating your point of difference throughout that, is that something that you think is critical to um, that having really solid content or a solid storyline? Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's a bit more complicated than telling people what your point of difference is. It's demonstrating it by having them read on. So engagement, is this something they haven't read before? Is this a point of view they strongly agree or strongly disagree with? Because coming back to that point or making people feel, if you've got conversation stream that makes people feel, then you'll, you'll have engagement. So I guess the most important thing is don't say it, show it. And how do you think people can do that in, in practice to, to make people feel? Yeah, you know, tell a story about a client, you know, and the lead. I mean, I spent years in journalism school back in the old day before the internet. My staff find that hilarious. Um, you know, I spent a, a whole semester on writing a headline, you know, because in a newspaper, if you don't get people on headline, they're not going to read. So make the first paragraph, the opening sentence of your video, the first minute of whatever content you're creating, so compelling that people have to read on. So if that starts with a personal story, and it might start with a storyline arc of, I'd never seen someone cry so much. It was my most challenging client, but my best. Or, you know, they walked out the door hand in hand and I knew I'd saved that marriage. That felt good. I mean, I'm making this up now. You can tell I like to yeah. be in love with man, but... Uh, that was something that people go, wow, how'd you do that? Or that's interesting. Or they were crying. You know, start yeah. with something interesting. If you want to read a book, you don't want to read a boring one. You know, think like you're a novelist. I um, had this amazing day once. I got to spend a day with Bryce Courtney, the author, um, for a show we did for Channel 9 called The Bottom Line. It was one of the best days of my life because he's a master storyteller. But 
Yeah. He just had so many interesting ways into every conversation he had. You know, it was just a lesson in listening to him. So yeah. find things that you find interesting and try and make your lead interesting. Yeah, awesome. I love that. Um, another one, I've got another one here from Adrian. What type of content do you get the highest levels of engagement from? Yeah, that's interesting because we have two streams. We have consumer and advisor. So um, I wrote a blog on, on Donald Trump, actually, after that election, after I subdued my rage. And um, that got really high engagement because it's what can we do practically in the advice community around things like this election and Brexit happening. So opinion. We get um, good pick up on aged care for advisors. We get a lot of interest in um, how to make SLAs more interesting. Those sort of subjects, we get really strong interest from advisors. Um, mm -hmm. On the consumer side, it's always what's in it for me. How changes in investment market affect you? How good advice can change you? So it's always about them. That's what gets us the best pick up. Yeah. And do you find, because you obviously, you create the the like the full clips and then you're saying you chop them up and distribute them across a variety of different channels do you find mm -hmm. that, that are people more into the sort of the shorter bite-sized pieces or um the the longer sort of more comprehensive type stories yeah it depends again on the audience um we actually had a lot of success on Facebook when we did our last TV show on Channel 9 in May. So we actually cut up like actual memes with a visual and three or four words like, will your money be enough for the next generation and a little baby hand and a grown up hand. And um, that was really successful on Facebook for us, much more successful than saying click through to see our TV show or hear this great advice. So um, I think we reached 660,000 people on Facebook with that kind of oh. um, creative execution. Whereas on LinkedIn, it took some interesting thought pieces and asking a question to get high engagement around LinkedIn. So again, it depends on the channel and the audience. Is it professional? Is it consumer? Is it a medium like Facebook where you're flicking and scrolling? Or is it something that people will spend more time on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think I think that's uh, that's really interesting. Getting six hundred thousand um, people engaged, uh, you can uh, you can get that type of engagement with me anytime. Because um, six hundred thousand people would be amazing. Um, I, I've got a question on because you do a lot of work with funds management, and you said you need to develop a um, a story or a point of difference. And especially in the funds management game, it, it must be really challenging to uh, have that point of difference. Um, so. My question is, uh, how do you measure success in that space? Um, do you guys sell on an, a return on investment uh, or is it more a branding piece for these fund managers? Uh, and how do you um, have that point of difference with the fund managers? It depends how we work with them. So we have um, sort of primary client base that we've actually hand selected and invited to be part of what we call the collective. Uh, and that's a maximum of 12 fund managers. And they are people that we cast in our show for Channel 9. Um, but they're also, we make ongoing education for them on a quarterly basis. So, you know, we're measuring success there by amount of viewers. We had 1.7 million viewers watch our Channel 9 show last time but we had another 2.3 million that we reached digitally during that period of hosting the TV show. So we get pretty big numbers. So from a reach perspective, the fund managers that we've selected to work with us obviously get, you know, pretty huge value in people seeing their brand and their actual fund manager talking about what they do. It's not just a static advertisement, but we also measure engagement of people doing their courses. So we create, Product training courses, which, you know, from an ASIC perspective is great because you have to know the product. So, and we can measure if people have passed the CPD test on it and if they've attempted the test. So that's a great measure of success. And then also engagement around the thought leadership conversations we run with them. And we're always trying to find interesting points of view to talk to those fund managers about that can teach advisors or can teach consumers something they didn't know where they can watch it in relatively short form um, in their own time. Awesome. Um, well, I've got a really good one here from Benjamin Martian. Just about, do you have any thoughts on whether content can be used to make SLAs more engaging for clients or do you have clients that are doing that? Um, like your clients or, 
um, any thoughts generally? Yeah, we do. And actually, um, this accounting firm we're working with keeps sending me videos whenever we have a meeting summarising our advice. And they've shot them on their iPhone. It's funny because I can't help but be critical because it's me. Um, <laughs> I thought, how cool that they're actually, but that's actually going as their record keeping piece of how they've had a meeting. They're shooting it on their iPhone, sending it to these client servers and then keeping it as a record. I thought that was neat. Um, and I think more and more people, you know, you, you're FaceTiming your family and your friends on your phone. It's becoming an accepted medium to do that. So they're a relatively young group of accountants who, oh, actually, they've born out of a financial advice firm. Um, We've had them on our TV show. They're called the Announcer Group. Andrew Rocks runs that. And so yeah. I think that's kind of cool that they do that and incorporate that into how they give advice. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, man, that sounds great. Uh, the last question we've got from the audience is from James Millard. Uh, if you create a regular series uh, on video uh, for advisors, should they use YouTube, Vimeo, both, straight to Facebook? What kind of platform do you think is important? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we use a, a number of things. We built our own platform because we wanted to own distribution. So we have our own, but that's, you know, you don't want to spend that money straight up as an advisor. I, I think YouTube or Vimeo are both pretty good. Like I don't, I think YouTube's the biggest serving platform in the world. You can't go wrong with that. But almost the kiss of death on any of those platforms is the fact that you can see the number of views. So if you make something and seven people have watched it, you know, then people look and go, well, that's, you know, everyone rates popularity on views on those big platforms. So that makes you a bit more exposed, I guess. Um, and you've got to constantly find ways to drag people to your conversation. But any of those platforms that are free, are good, you know, a good value to start a content conversation. You just got to keep driving people there. Yeah, no, I, this conversation has been mind blowing. I've, I like to write down like three takeaways and I've written about 25. Uh, but my kind of top six uh, is uh, that money is interesting. Finance is boring. Uh, that's, that's a very interesting kind of point And I totally agree. Uh, content is a beast that you need to keep feeding. Uh, clearly defined distribution channels. Uh, I really like the fact that you said um, let the content live on that channel. Uh, often we're always told, always bring people back to your website or bring people back to kind of your, uh, your own content. Uh, but, yeah, letting it live on that channel is really interesting take uh, and something we don't often hear. Um, and making people feel uh, when you're producing content uh, and get the story right. So, Vanessa, it's been mind-blowing. I know that uh, other people have enjoyed it. And we did have one last question, which we're going to leave it. Um, so, I just want to thank you so much for coming uh, and sharing all your expertise with us today. So, thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And well done for doing things like this. This um, is great. And the fact that we had Naked Man Eating Cereal on screen shows that you can actually <laughs> share conversations anywhere, anytime. And that's the future, right? So, well done to you guys. That's right. Thank Thanks you very much. Um, so everyone still on board. We've got a Christmas party in Sydney for anyone in Sydney. Um, it's on the 12th of December, Bar 100 in 100 George Street. Uh, so there was an email out yesterday or the other day or two weeks ago about that. So make sure you register or just email Ben directly, ben.nash at pivotwealth.com.au if you want more information. Uh, we've also got CPD points for anyone who's watching uh, and we love CPD points. So, Benny, do you know how we get the CPD points? No, I don't, Bill. <laughs> Okay, me neither. Naked Man is organising it. So we're going to email it out to everyone who is on this webinar. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Next fortnight, we've got Vince Scully from Life Sherpa, and he's going to talk about how he's um, creating an advice service um, for $12.50 per month uh, where people can access a financial advisor. So really a low cost, low touch service. Uh, so we're going to kind of learn from him what he's doing well, you know, what mistakes he may have made during that time. So look out for an email in the next fortnight. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks Ben. And thanks Vanessa again. Thanks My Vanessa. Pleasure. Bye everyone. Bye guys. Bye-bye.